um, I was sent some, hu- I like humor. How many of you like humor? And uh, I was sent a list of some humorous things to which I responded to the good doctor uh, who usually sits right over there. I said, you will see these again, meaning I'm going to use these. All right. Um, here, here's one. Uh, the older I get, the more I understand why roosters scream to start their day. Uh, you know you're over 50 when you have upstairs ibuprofen and downstairs ibuprofen. <laughs> yeah. All right. And we'll end with this one. If only vegetables smelled as good as bacon. Hallelujah. We're starting a new series this morning. God's human family. God's human family. And we are going over the next few weeks to cover a lot of different subjects. I would imagine that some uh, some of you may have some theological questions answered in the next few weeks as we kind of we're going to take our time with this. We're not just going to rush into it. We're going to look at humanity. We're going to look at our purpose. We're going to look at our uh, our uh, uh, composition. We're going to look at our function. We're going to look at all of those things, knowing that uh, that God has a purpose for us. Amen. In Psalm eight. Beginning in verse 1, in fact, this is the entire psalm, 1 through 9. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of uh, babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens... The work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. I want you to notice that. The moon and the stars, which you have set in place. That's important. God keeps emphasizing that. If you go through the prophets in particular, you will see that he says, I who spread out the heavens and I who who laid the the foundation and everything. He is emphasizing that neither El nor Baal nor Chemosh or Marduk or any of those deities is the creator. He and he alone is the creator. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. This is the ESV. Heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and have put all things under his feet. Oh, that's wow. All sheep and oxen and beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Those aren't just pretty words. That is a statement of cosmogony, cosmology, anthropology, angelology. I mean, there's a lot of ologies in there. Hallelujah. You know, and so starting today, where do you start? Well, let's start at the beginning. In fact, we're going to go back before the beginning. How is that possible? Well, hang on and find out. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, again the ESV. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that is not the beginning of everything. That is the beginning of the physical universe. It is the beginning of the part of history that has to do directly with us. How many humans do we have here today? Is anybody here human? Okay, then this is your, this is your, this is your stuff, all right? Here in Genesis 1-1, we see Yahweh, and specifically, as we discover later, Yahweh the Word, creating the physical universe to include space, to include time, to include galaxies with their stars and their planets and the, all of the asteroids and, the, and all of the, the parts of the physical universe. But before that, the angelic hosts had already been created. There were already 
myriads of angels in existence, the Elohim, before God even created the heavens and the earth. They are called the Elohim, the gods, small g, or the mighty ones. What are they? They are shining, iridescent beings of all ranks and strengths and glory. We see them. We see over in Daniel, it talks about the watchers. There are watcher class spirits that are mighty, mighty, mighty beings. They are Elohim of tremendous power. But then we see also in Daniel how at the introduction of the Son of Man, he says, I saw thrones, plural, set up. What were these thrones? It wasn't for the 12 apostles sitting on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel because this was the presentation of the Son of Man that would be Jesus to be the Savior. And it says and that it, there were thrones set up. Number one, who set them up? There are angelic beings to do that. And then who sat on those thrones? The divine council. The watchers. The, 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 the mighty Elohim such as Gabriel or Michael and others. Some of which, whom are named in, in, in Enoch. But that's not important here. The point is, these are mighty, mighty beings who were created before the physical universe. And in fact, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, it says, For by him, meaning Jesus, who is of course the word made flesh, all things were created in heaven and on earth. Notice it didn't say in the heavens. The heavens, as we'll get to, is the atmospheric. There are two heavens, the atmosphere around us and then the celestial heavens, which comprise interstellar space, the space time continuum out there where the enterprise is zipping around and where Luke Skywalker is doing his thing. All right. Except that none of that is happening. All right. And so it says he created everything in heaven. And so the point is everything in heaven. And he goes on to name specific things, whether thrown, both visible and invisible. This universe was created, created ex nihilo out of nothing by our father through his word. All right. And it says whether thrones or dominions or rulers or. Or authorities, all things visible and invisible, spirit realms invisible to us. Okay, unless the Lord, through discerning of spirits, decides to pull the curtain back and let us see. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, those are mighty angelic spirits. All things were created through him and for him. So the word created these magnificent angelic beings who were present when Yahweh God, the word, created the physical universe. In fact, in Job 38, God is challenging Job and he says to Job, beginning in verse four, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? God always comes back to that. It's like when he says, I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. He says that how many times to Israel? Four or five thousand? That's probably not that many, but it's a lot. What is he doing? It's like, it's like the mama saying to her children, I am, the, I am your mother. I brought you into this world. Or like the father saying, I am your dad. I brought you into this world and I can take you out. All right. And so... He loves to, to remind us, I am the beginning, I am the author, I am the creator, I am the sustainer of all things. All right? He says, where were you? This is back to Job 4, or 38, 4. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched out the line upon it? He's using human construction terms so that, you know, so that we would understand. On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid the cornerstone? Listen to verse 7. When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. The Elohim were, 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 were present 
All of the angelic spirits were there while God created the universe and they were amazed. They were gobsmacked by what they, they were not co-creators. They had nothing to do with the creation except to worship, to praise him and say, man, oh man, is that awesome. And you know, the scripture says over in Ephesians that for eternity, God is going to continue to roll out greater and greater and greater demonstrations and manifestations of his love for us. Now, if that doesn't give you a brain cramp, nothing will. C.S. Lewis saw eternity one time. He described it as like a spiral. Every time I think of that, I think of that old TV show. You have to be of a certain age to remember the time tunnel. And whenever they went into the time tunnel, there was this vortex that was just, you know, they would go into the, ah, into this. And, 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 and that's the way C.S. Lewis saw it. It was a spiral, it was a vortex into which we are going. We, as humans, are going, as believers, are going deeper and deeper, deep and deeper into the heart of God. And even though we keep going deeper for eternity, because he is infinite, we never arrive. <sighs> Tilt. I'm looking forward to heaven if for no other reason to be able to understand some of the things I can't get my head wrapped around here. All right. And he says the morning stars. Lucifer, the light bearer, Halel ben Shakar, the son of the morning. He's not the only shining being. They're all that way. You see him over in Daniel. I mean, wow, they are radiant. And when he talks about the host of heaven, how they were shining, they the, the, in, the, in, the, in the days of, of Enoch, in the days of, of Noah, these beings walked the earth. They walked the earth in the days of Adam. We'll get to that a little later, not today. And they are radiant. They were witnesses, these angelic spirit, that our father was creating something new, and something wonderful. The heavens and the earth, not the heaven where God lives, but the, the, the universe and the atmosphere. The heaven where God lives is the third heaven. Paul makes reference to that in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, uh, referring to what I believe was his experience. It makes sense no other way. I know a man, although he speaks of it in the third person, to, to be humble. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to what? The third heaven. That's where God lives. The first heaven is the atmosphere around us, where wicked spirits are. The second heaven is the cosmos, which is beyond their reach, but, and to an extent beyond ours, I suppose. And I know that this man, look at this, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows. Verse three, and I know that this man was caught up to what? Into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. He goes on to say where he heard words that it's not lawful for a man to utter. That was into the very presence of God himself. Now, when I say, I say the physical universe, because when I refer to the creation around us, because that's what God was creating in Genesis, beginning in Genesis 1.1. I want you to think about this. Astronomers tell us and physicists tell us that the earth is anomalous in that it is exactly the right distance from our sun to support life as we know it. Any further away, it would be too cold. Any closer, and it would be too hot. The gravitational uh, pull of the moon affects the tides. And, th there is, and we, we see this constant... You know, think about your own body. Talk about our unity and our, our uh, what's the word I want to... Our harmony 
with the universe around us. You know uh, how that there, God has this constant flow. We have the jet streams. We have the flow of the tides. We have the flow of the air around us. And we have the winds, which are necessary because if we just had no wind at any time, the pollination situation would be dramatically. In, uh, and it w- there would be no breeze to bring up the, 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 um, the moisture from the, from the ocean so that the water... Uh, the earth could be watered, etc. Just like in your body, the blood must constantly flow. You must continue to breathe. You might stop eating for a little while, but you will not stop eating permanently or you will stop being permanently. All right. Same with, you know, you can't get it long as uh, get by without water as long. It's a flow. And we, you know, we have not, we haven't found a single exoplanet. We found very few exoplanets, in other words, planets outside of our, our uh, solar system yet. And in fact, we demoted Pluto. You know, no longer a planet. It's now a planetoid. I see T-shirts from the kind of, I miss Pluto. You know, I <laughs> saw one when we were down at Branson. The, you know, but, you know, the, we haven't found any other class M planets Those of you who are Star Trek fans know exactly what I mean by that. In other words, a planet like Earth. All right. And I know there's the narrative of the Big Bang or whatever the latest physical thing is about how it took billions of years and slow evolutionary development by some mysterious mechanism that cannot be proven or observed. Yet we will believe in it and face you religious people down. All right. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the last 40 or 50 years, paleontologists have discovered, have unearthed dinosaur bones that are so fresh, they still had blood in them. Yeah, it's been published in, uh, in the Smithsonian Magazine, among other things. And uh, they've even found in China, there's a dig there where they found skin and feathers. I know some of you didn't know that dinosaurs had feathers, but some of them did. All right. And viable or near viable DNA within it. You know, the problem is that and that's been in both sides of the world. It hadn't just been over in China. It's been they've had some of that here. They've had that other place and they test it and they say this can't be over 16,000 years old. But that flies in the face of the radiocarbon. And, you know, it's got, you know, how many millions of years has it been since the, you know, whatever scene period. And so, you know, even though they publish it and they can and they and these are Ph.D.s who have their stuff together. And they, in fact, one one Ph.D. was saying that when she had made these discoveries, she presented them to the you know, she and her team presented them and they said, OK, now figure out a way to make them uh, five billion years old. Why? Because the minute you start publishing anything that disagrees with the narrative, you are going to get criticized and canceled. Science, as we used to understand it, is gone. Don't follow the new science any more than the new math. Anyway, moving along. We have a narrative that's, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind is made up. This new thing God created was physical. It, the dust of the world, it had, it had physical it was, it, it was a, the physical universe. It didn't exist before. And we see between Genesis 1-1 and, and, and there is what's called the gap theory between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 that there are millions of years. I have previously subscribed to that and I s- still do not reject it completely. But the more I've gotten into Old Testament scholarship, the less I'm sure that that is true. It doesn't, have, it doesn't matter whether it is or not. The point is, God created it all. And, you know, uh, we are not given the details or specific times. But a general chronology, we see the sea life, followed by the birds, followed by the land animals. And not too strangely, all of these species had a great deal in common. I remember when I was a kid, I was cleaning fish. We, my dad 
got on a jag of wanting to go fishing. And so we were down catching crappie and at Grand Lake. When I say down to Grand Lake, we lived in Tulsa. So Grand Lake was down from us, south of us. And we'd go down there and we would catch crappie and we would catch uh, uh, the occasional bluegill or, or, or catfish. And my dad taught me how to clean the crappie. And when I would cut off the head and then I would open it up and gut it and the fish's organs came out. You know, they were all in there. And I said to my dad, what's that? And he goes, that's the liver. Fish have livers? Yeah. How many of you have a liver? Do cows have livers? Do sheep have livers? How about wolves and, and otters and, and seals and, and whales? Do they have livers? Isn't it interesting that we have a great deal in common with the creation? They, you know, some of them are aquatic, understand, they breathe through gills. Others are, 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 have lungs and are land animals and breathe, you know, through with, with lungs. And we see all of these created. And interestingly, while some of our species reproduce asexually, most of them, particularly of the higher forms, reproduce sexually. It takes a male and it takes a female. Obviously, the animal kingdom hasn't kept up with stuff. All right? And they, whether it's dolphins or it's whales or it's cattle or it's apes or, you know, uh, uh, canines or felines, it takes, a, it takes a, a double X and an XY to create a new one. All right? Now, in the, you know, and the humans, or the, not just the humans, but the females carry, uh, carry the young or lay the eggs. Last to the party was humanity. We, and when I say we, I'm talking about corporate we, obviously, because in Adam, we will, and we'll, we'll get into that later, not today. All of us were in Adam, all of, every last one of us. All of the races were in Adam. Every racial difference that you see today is as a result of selective breeding. It's not as a result of, you know, you know I know people say, well, God created the races at, at um, the Tower of Babel. There's absolutely no proof that that's true. We know he, he confused their languages. But selective breeding, you know, people being attracted to people who are like them has produced. How many of you are aware of the fact how many kinds of dogs do we see today? Oh, my goodness. I, was, you, I mean, you tell me that a Chihuahua and a Sharpe or a Bull Mastiff or a Husky or a Lahasa Apsa or, you know, a Chihuahua, all of those dogs go back to one pair. Do you know that? They can genetically prove that. In fact, for that matter, they can prove that every man, talking about human males, go back to one male and every female goes back to one female. Oh, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind is made up. And all of those dogs, all of those different kinds of dogs go back to one pair. Well, how do you account for the Sharpe or the Bull Mastiff or the... You know, the English Bulldog versus the Chihuahua or the Teacup Yorkie. They're both dogs. How on earth did this happen? Selective breeding where different gene types were brought to the front. In humanity, all of the races, all of the genetics were in Adam. I'm getting ahead of myself. But is it interesting yet? All right. And so... God, in chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 7, it says, And Yahweh, God, formed the man of dust from the ground. Wow. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That becomes significant later on. We'll come back to that. And the man became a living, the ESV says creature, but the, the Hebrew says soul. He became a living soul. 
God had, he formed him of the what? Dust of the ground. Adam's body was made of the very stuff of this creation. Why? Because God wanted Adam to be of this creation and identify with it. When he looks at a cow, he knows that cow and I have a lot in common. When I pet the dog, that dog and I have a lot in common. Not everything, I understand. But we, we are kindred in a very real sense with him. Now, don't get into this kumbaya stuff. Here, you know, we're not worshiping nature. We're not pantheists and we're not worshiping nature, etc. We're just saying there is that because they animals have souls. It says so in Ecclesiastes, animals have souls. Well, guess what? When Adam, when God breathed in him, he became a living soul. And again, hang on to that thought. Male and female. We'll get to that as well. Eve was not an afterthought. It's not like, oh, you know, he's named all these animals and there isn't anybody here. I mean, all the other animals had pairs and, you know, he's he's going it solo here. This isn't right. That was <sighs> Eve was not an afterthought. And those of us who are men said, amen. And those of you who are ladies said, amen. All right. Again, male and female, just like the, the rest of the uh, rest of the of the creation. And when cattle or sheep or dogs or cats or what they mate, they conceive. There is a gestation period. Then they bring forth their young. And their young begin to grow and develop and mature, as in most cases, not all, the, the parents nurture them. Well, guess what? We've got the same thing in humanity. Why? Because God wanted his man and his woman, his humanity, to be kindred with the physical universe around us. We are the same and yet starkly different at the same time. We go to Genesis 1 and 26. Then Elohim, God, said, let us make man in our image. This is not a conversation within the Godhead. This is the divine counsel. They have all stood and watched this. And God says, now let us make humanity. Because the word translated man there is the Hebrew word Adam. Which doesn't just stand for Adam. It stands for all of humanity in general. In Greek, they would use the word anthropoi from which we get our word anthropology, meaning human being, and coincidentally coming from the root meaning the upward looking one. And so let us make man in our image after our likeness. Likeness has nothing to do with appearance. All right? How do I know that? Because not all spirits look alike. Not all spirits look human. How many of you have seen the... Uh, when you talk about the Kerevim, the Kruv, the, the throne guardians, face like a man, face like an ox, face like, you know, how many of you are with me here? Face like a lion. So it's like, wh what? And they have wings and then hands under their wings. That doesn't sound terribly human. In fact, some places they're called the Seraphim. And Seraphim are fire serpents. Fire because they are radiant, but they actually have a, apparently, a reptilian appearance. Now, that probably freaks some people out because reptiles are evil. See, we go back to the garden and we're going to, and I'm giving you previews of coming attractions here. We're going to talk about the temptation. We're going to talk about the fall. We're going to talk about the impacts that it has. So you will know what's going on in you. And more importantly, in your neighbors. <laughs> and, the, and the people driving around you. And why they behave the way they do. All right? And so, the, the, you, you, but apparently, the creator of reptiles thinks reptiles look great. 
Because he created the reptile. And people say, well, what about the garden? That was in the hash, the serpent. It was not an animal. It wasn't a talking snake. It was a being of immense beauty and intelligence. Who apparently had a serpentine or reptilian look to him. So we've immediately, because of the serpent, Nachash, we have associated that with evil. But it says in the, in the regeneration that the, the young child will reach down into the adder's hole and the snakes won't even bite. We used to laugh about it when I, was, when I first came into uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and really got serious for God. I was in the army and a number of us individuals, soldiers there in that station had been filled with the Spirit, and God was really doing great things in that church, and it was so much fun. And we would talk about theological subjects, you know, soldiers getting together and discussing theological things. It was kind of unusual, as you might imagine. And I remember one of my friends who went on to be special operations and Delta Force and everything like that, saying, yes, in the garden before the fall, Adam would lie down in the grass, and the bugs would come up and kiss on him. Instead of bite him. Well, why do bugs bite? Stay tuned. All right. So he says, let us make humanity. Humanity was not another animal. Let me say that again for the benefit of those who need to hear. Or as my coach, one of my football coaches used to say, for the benefit of the deaf and dumb, let me say that again. He said, humanity is not an animal, even though we have a skeletal structure just like the higher forms, even though we have the internal organs that the higher forms have, even though we have intestines, even though we eat, even though we have refuse, even though all of those things, you know, just like animals, we're not animals. We are a completely different class of creation. And we know this. Remember, we just got through reading over in, in Job about how the sons of God, uh, what was the exact... All the sons of God shouted for joy. And yet in Luke 3, where Luke is giving the, the genealogy of Jesus, he's working his way from Jesus all the way back to the beginning. And in 38, verse 38 of Luke 3, the son of Enosh, the son of Set, the son of Adam of Adon, the son of God. Adam was and is the son of God. And so God created a new kind of son. A new kind of Elohim. And, and he was supposed to be the God, small g, of this world giving dominion. Humans are every bit as much sons of God as the angels. Are you hearing me? We're just a very different sort of a very, a very different type from a very different environment. And when God breathed on Adam, it says he became a living soul. Why did the Old Testament say nefesh? Why did it say soul? Because it was an identification of how this creation, dare I call him the crown of God's creation, was one with that creation. But at the same time, he wasn't just a soul. He also was spirit. That's what makes us sentient. That what, that's the part of us that makes us God aware. That is when the scripture says, let us make them in our likeness. It has nothing to do with appearance. It has to do with the fact that we are spirits, even as he is a spirit. Even as the Elohim, the angelic hosts are spirits. So we are one with this world and yet... One, in theory, with the spirit realm. We are people. I've heard people say that we are people of three worlds. The mental world, the flesh, the, the physical world. The, the soulish, I don't count as its own world. 
Your soul, an animal's soul, is linked to its body, and it's the animating principle within the animal. It, when your body dies, and if Jesus tarries long enough, it will. Nobody's getting out of this alive. You're hearing me, all right? Your, yes, your soul animates your body, but your spirit animates, gives life to your soul. And that's why you know who you are and that you know you're not a dog. And you know people from people and you can hear the voice of God. We are anthropoi, the upward looking ones. All right. So Adam wasn't just a soul. He is a spirit. Humanity is not. Now, we're turning the narrative upside down. I understand that. When I was a kid, my favorite thing to do was read science fiction novels. I loved Robert Heinlein and Andre Norton, and I'm naming some older people because that's, you know, I, I, you know, I uh, got out of that at some point. Reading about, you know, the adventures of, and I love Star Trek. My, uh, Kathy told me that Star Trek was very popular in her house growing up, her brothers, all back in the early 60s. You know, when you look at it today, it's cheese. You know, you know the special effects are pure cheese and everything, but for the day, it was so cool to have a, have a series, The Wagon Train to the Stars, and everything. And I still enjoy it. You know, Mr. Wolf, you know, <laughs> delicious. What an awesome, you know, there, it's all kinds of, it's, it's all kinds of fun. So we have been prepared to believe. Why would we train that? Because the narrative is that this rock, the third rock from Saul, our son, is just an inconsequential speck of dust, which just accidentally happened to be exactly the right distance from the star and have exactly the right, or either that or our planet was seeded with, with life by some other advanced race, where they came from is still up in the air. And, all the, and the thing of it is, we have all of these narratives out there, but nobody deals with why is, and this is something, believe it or not, this is, this is purely in Western thought, why is there not just nothing? Have you ever asked yourself that question? How did, why is there anything? Why is there not just nothing? People from the East will look at you and go, well, that's stupid. Because they don't think that way. But we do. We think, they think effect back to cause. We think cause to effect. And so we're always looking for the move. What, what caused this to happen? They're always going, okay, we know something caused it. But we're going, oh, wait a minute. What was it? And we're looking for the unmoved mover, the first cause. And his name is Yahweh. And his word became flesh and he created us and he designed us with purpose and if that's true then he knows better than anyone exactly how then how we should then live all right now am i saying that reading science fiction is blasphemous or anything like that no I still enjoy a good science fiction movie, as long as you don't have to feel the necessary necessity to make it woke out the years, because that's happening a lot. And I'll, I, you know, I, I, I enjoy it because, you know, we need to deal with those evil Cardassians. You know, they're a problem. All right. And the Romulans. I mean, really, the Tellarites. I mean, come on. Some of you know of whom I speak, or of what I speak. All right. And see, the, the, we can make, and the reason it all is believable is because we've been sold this bill of goods that in other places in the universe, uh, you know, intelligent species have developed as well. Are you saying that there, are, there is no life anywhere on any other planet? No, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that if there is, I know who put it there. Amen. Amen. Simple as that. All right. Well, what about UFOs? Those are real. What about alien abductions? Those are real, but they are not 
inter, uh, uh, they are not galactic beings. They are interdimensional beings who have always been here. We'll get to that. Adam was to rule. Look at the, again, uh, if we go back to Genesis 1 and 26. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion. Everybody say dominion. Okay, what is, what is that? That's boss-ship. That's rulership. Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. We are his imagers. We bear his likeness, his authority, his directive. No, you know, we are not in, in, in being rulers over the earth doesn't mean we're doing our own thing. Being his imagers means we are his representatives. It's like a man who had a great business and said, you know what? This thing's really expanding. I've decided the way I'm going to run it is I'm going to have a bunch of kids. I'm going to train all my kids, my sons and daughters, and they're going to run it for me. Do I need them to run it? No, I'm doing a perfectly good job and could continue to do so. But I really want a family. This is what I want to do. And it is an expression of the creativity and the love that is in his heart. Did he need the angels? No. Are you aware of the fact that God is incapable of feeling lonesome? He doesn't feel lonely. And he created the angels and has his divine counsel. And he created a new Elohim who eventually would come and rule and reign with him. And when you see God's plan of salvation, you talk about something awesome. Which we will get to. I keep throwing out my little uh, advertisements. All right. And so what are we doing for the next few weeks? James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. ESV again. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Fooling, deceiving, lying to yourselves. You know, to deceive yourself doesn't just mean to lie to yourself. It means to lie to yourself and believe it. If anyone is a hearer, that's hypocrisy, I understand. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural, literally soulish, face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and once at once forgets what he was like. But... The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, that would be the scripture. And perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. We are looking in the mirror of the scripture to see what manner of being we are. How God designed us. What is his plan for us? What is this male-female thing? What is this family thing? What, what's, you know, what's, what is God doing? We are going to see all of these things as our musicians would come. And unlike the fool who forgets who he is and forgets what he is. You know, how many of you wake up in the morning and one of the first things you do is look in the mirror? And not because you are into a horror show. But to see what needs doing before you hit the bricks. Right? Or maybe, as this happens to me once in a while, I'll wake up and one of my eyes will be very, very dry. How many of you have that happen? You wake up and it's like, oh my gosh, and it's all you can do to move it. And, you know, you go into the mirror and you're eh, like this to look at, make sure everything in there, everything in there is okay. We don't have this massive inflammation. You don't hear from, you know, your spouse doesn't hear from the bathroom. I think I have pink eye. Amen. Has anybody ever, I wonder what that was. <laughs> anybody, <laughs> does, has anybody ever, you know, checked your tongue? Eh. Or you're looking at your. Okay, pastor, you're getting a little graphic here. Okay. The point is, we're looking, we're inspecting. Why? To see what we need to do. Exactly. All right. My view, and, and, and you know, now here, I want you to understand this. I'm going to say something you 
probably hadn't thought about. Maybe you have. And my view of creation is not unique. Theologians have shared this for millennia. Granted, the church was overzealous about it during the Middle Ages. And if you don't believe that, just ask Copernicus or Galileo, and they can tell you what heat the church brought on them as they made the decision that the earth actually went around the sun instead of the other way around. We still have people today that believe the earth is flat. You know, no, I'm serious about that. We do. All right. Due to a misinterpretation of scripture and much, you know, which were largely political in nature, you know, they were persecuted. But the fact that they missed it doesn't nullify the truth of scripture in any way. One of the greatest theologians, uh, Old Testament theologians in history who passed away about six years ago was a guy named a guy named John Salehammer who restricted the Genesis account to the land of Palestine or Judea itself, saying that the narrative of creation was in Moses. What was in Moses view was the creation of the promised land for the people, not necessarily the creation of the entire universe. That is very, very possible. Although I think it would apply to both. And he, as an eminent authority on the Hebrew language, corrected the Septuagint, which guides, which is the Old Testament translated into Greek, by 70 or 72, depending on your source, uh, Jewish scholars in Alexandria, uh, back well before New Testament days. And he, it says, and I'm going to read you the ESV here, Yahweh God took, well actually, or the Lord God, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. To work it and to keep it. That made Adam a glorified gardener. Sure it did. You know, now I realize where it says keep it, it's the Septuagint uses the word phylake, which means to, to guard or to, to superintend. And so that's helpful. But Salehammer said this, Yahweh Elohim took the man and rested. Another trend, rendering of that word would be settled him in the Garden of Eden to worship and obey. That rendering obeys all of the rules of Hebrew grammar. Cultivate and keep do not, does not. Rested and settled him there to worship, that's relationship, and obey, do in the administration of this world what he planned. I want you to think about this. Not only was Adam not an afterthought, Adam was the first thought. God said, I'm going to create a new thing. I'm going to create a new Elohim. I'm going to create an entirely new group of mighty ones. And it's going to be very different from anything I've done before. But before I create him, because this is the, this is the pattern I have for him, I'm going to need to create a world in which he can live. I'm going to create, need to create an entire ecosystem. And when I mean ecosystem, I don't just mean, you know, our, the earth. I'm talking about the earth and the space, the space-time continuum and everything that's in it because it's all interrelated. I'm going to have to create all of that and get it ready. Then once it's ready, remember, Adam is the son of God. And anybody who's ever been pregnant and had been expecting children, and I include the men in that because, you know, our wives were with child and ready to come. What do we do? We prepare the environment for the child. And so... We're not just an accident. This universe was created for us. Yes. What? Yes, it was created for the Lord. But he said, let me make an environment that is so wholly different than anything. And the angels were going, there, it's, 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 got, I, it's like, I don't even know what it is. But it's really pretty. 
Anybody who's been to Colorado or to the tropics or any other scenic place on earth goes, and believe me, it's nowhere near as pretty as it used to be. And guess what? At the end, the world doesn't go away. We get a brand new heavens and a brand new earth. Why? Because God hasn't changed his mind about any of it. You know what? I got half an hour here before noon. I may just cut out and preach. <laughs> it was made for us. And God rested the man and his wife in the garden. Was it a nursery? No. Not in the purest sense. It was the perfect place. And what well, was the whole earth identic? Potentially. We'll get to that at some point. That's before physical evil entered the earth. Humanity had a destiny. And that was to walk this earth as his agents and representatives. And with a word, all Adam had to do when he looks down, you know, and the elephants had gotten someplace that they shouldn't be. He could say, hey. You boys, out of there. You know better than that. Move it. <laughs> and they'd move. Yeah. Because we didn't have, things weren't eating things. And that's something that, that, that's something that became, I mean, you know, the, it, well, um, I, I, I've just got a thousand ways I could go. And I'm, so I'm going to, all right. Humanity has a destiny. That the enemy and evil itself has tried to subvert. And God has said, uh -uh. I will have my way. And it, because he looked at humanity, the crown of his physical creation, and he was so intent on redeeming us that he became one of us he became he didn't become an angel it says over in Hebrews God has not given help to angels but to men and to women he became a human being he became one of us just like Adam was to identify with the creation God has now identified with his creation completely there is a man in heaven sitting at the right hand of God. Fully man, while yet being fully God. So I can't get my head wrapped around that. Just give up trying. But it's, God can do anything he wants and he is not limited to what we can understand. Thank you, Jesus. And now, guess who the second man, the last Adam, is the crown of his creation. And we, walk with him. Let's all stand. Those of you watching by internet, thank you for joining us. I hope this blessed you. I hope you got something out of it. We're going to get to redemption because you have to understand that to know what God did in humanity and why so many things that we see today are perversions and corruptions of that and are destined to bring all kinds of suffering and already are. But the one thing I want to leave you with more than anything else is that you must be born again. God has a new humanity, a new man. If you want to call it a humanity update, humanity reboot, humanity 2.0, if you wish, fine. But the way that happens is you must be born again. And to be born again, that's what Jesus said. You must. It's an obligation. You have to. No, no new birth, no new life. No new birth, no heaven. And the way you do that is to cry out to the Father and say, I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe you have raised him from the dead. I repent of my life. I repent of my sin. And Father, I ask you to send Jesus. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. The scripture says you will be born again to a living, breathing hope. Hallelujah eternal life. Thank you, Father. And for those of you who are believers and you have not uh, engaged, you've not jumped in, I encourage you 
in the name above every name, Jesus the Nazarene, to get involved, to, to, to give everything into the body of Christ, become a part of a church, pray, study the scriptures, give, do the things that we are called to do so that you can be, the, the, the Lord has spoken to this congregation, to me and to this congregation, very clearly saying, get close to me, get close to me, get close to me. Because those who lag, it's not going to go well. And so I urge you, believer, get in there in Jesus' name.